Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the Life Impact uh, Bible Study for the New Bethel Church, located right at 745 Walker Ave Avenue in Kansas City, Kansas. We are excited about the class tonight. We're excited that you have decided to join us. We want you to right off the bat, I love an interactive Bible study. I love to see all of the comments and the talking back and the saints fellowshipping with each other while in the chat. We may not be in the physical building for this class, but while we are on here, we are still together. So we want you to get in that chat. You don't have to just listen to it. You can be interactive. You can say, your, I want to see your amens and your thank you, Jesus. As a matter of the fact, go out there right now. Go on the comment section right now from the jump. And I want you to type these words. I love Jesus. Listen, we are not ashamed of the gospel in Christ. We are not ashamed of this great gospel. We want the world to know that we love the Lord and we are not ashamed of it. So I wanted to start out by being a little big on the screen right now, but I'm going to minimize myself and let us get into this dynamic Bible study on today. So first off, I want you to like, to share. This is your kind reminder like it, share it, comment, save it, do all of those things on Facebook, Twitter, whatever your uh, your social media outlets are. If you want to make a TikTok about it, if you want to make a little video reel about it, put all of that out there on social media because we want the world to know that we are studying our word, that we are getting into our life impact. And we don't just call it Bible study. This is life impact. So again, you're joining us, the New Bethel Church. We're in our 75th year anniversary. As a matter of the fact, just earlier this month, the end of last month, we went through all of our celebratory uh, things that we were going through to celebrate our 75th anniversary, and it's not over. We're celebrating still right now as we speak. So those of you that have made pledges and things of that matter, we want you to still, if you didn't pay it by the uh, certain time, you have time. You still have time to get out there and uh, do your pledges and things of that matter for our 75th year anniversary. Uh, those that are physically here in the Kansas City area, when you go by our church, you see how we have done some upgrades. We painted the exterior of both of our buildings, made updates there. I mean, we've even put in new doors over in the Haven Center, We're doing a lot of things. So we want you to celebrate with us during this 75-year anniversary. You're welcome to give. Now, also giving honor to our great bishop and leader, uh, Bishop Aglin Brady and Lady Angela Brady. Uh, just thank, thank you guys for allowing me to join in and teach on tonight. This is a great opportunity, and I feel honored and blessed. I am Staff Pastor LaShawn Relliford, Staff Pastor here right at the New Bethel Church. And we're going to get into our studies on today. I mean, I'm excited because I'm fresh. I mean, literally fresh coming from the, I think that was the 108th uh, National Convention of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. It was in St. Louis last week. And I'm telling you, we had an outstanding time. Those of you that maybe once were convention goers and then you may have taken a break from conventions, this, this St. Louis convention revived something in my spirit. I'm already excited about next year. I want, I, I'm making plans now to be in attendance for next year should the Lord allow us to see it. It was exciting. And guess what? You can go on YouTube and look at the, the sessions that were recorded the, in the main uh, area. You had Bishop Noel Jones, uh, Dr. Jackie McCullough, Dr. Barbara Golder, Bishop 
Brooks, I mean, you name it, they were there and the sessions were outstanding. So go back on there, listen to them. I guarantee you it'll feed your soul. And if you're really feeling excited, you can go ahead and register next year for the 2024 PAW uh, convention, which is going to be held in the great state of Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, July 21st through the 27th. You can register now. You can make your hotel reservations now and prepare to be with us. Let's flood Baltimore, Maryland out and, and leave the anointing of God in the city. I know God's anointed is already there because the people of God are there, but let's just blow this thing up. So I'm excited about that. Uh, we have had our staff pastors here who have been doing uh, some of the teaching and things this month for the month of July. Sunday before last, we heard from the Honorable Pastor John Mark Talbert. Yes, I said Honorable. He is Honorable. He uh, came from the sermon, I Still Have Joy. Reminds me of the song, uh, after all the things that I've been through, I, I still have joy. If you enjoy that, put that in the chat window. I still have joy. We enjoyed that sermon. And then on last week, last week, oh my gosh, this past Sunday, Pastor Carl McKinney came through and delivered the word, now comes light. Time to say yes. That sermon, uh, that message was so impacting. I loved it. And uh, one of the most impacting portions of that sermon, you, you ought to go back and watch it if you did not get a chance to, uh, uh, one of the, the greatest impacts for me was how he painted the picture of the guy waiting at the side of the pool. And he said, close your eyes, imagine yourself getting ready for your healing, getting ready for your deliverance. And listen, then at the end of that, he said, now uh, somebody gets in before you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was taken back. I was ready. I was like, oh, my gosh, now somebody. And then Bishop Brady came along and he said, you know, that healing was already set for him. He didn't have to get in the pool. He didn't have to get in the water. He could have just started walking in his yes. All God wants is a yes from you. Oh my gosh, that was so exciting, so wonderful. Uh, so anyway, let's get into our lesson, but, but right before we do, I want to remind you, uh, coming up Friday, August the 18th, I need you to mark your calendars for uh, this date from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, bookstore, uh, not bookstore, but a book club here at the New Bethel Church. And it's not just for the members. I mean, you can join in in this book club and join us in virtual means. We have a Facebook page out there. We can have discussions out there. You can put your comments in that club. Uh, but we are going to be discussing the book Disruptive Thinking by Bishop T.D. Jakes. I have been in this book, uh, and sometimes I have to go back and read again, read a chapter again, because it's so life-impacting. So you need to get this book. You can get it electronically. You can go to a bookstore. And those of you all that love Amazon and all of that stuff, order the book, get the study guide, have it delivered. Uh, those of you that like Audible, Order the book through Audible, and as you're driving or you're cleaning the home or whatever you may doing, you may be doing, uh, you can listen to the book. It is an outstanding read, but the book club is going to be coming together again on August the 18th, that Friday evening from 6 to 9 in the New Bethel Church Haven Center. So we need you to sign up and be a part of that plan to attend. Uh, you can sign up by uh, emailing uh, our very own Sister Jeanette uh, Sims Baxby. 
uh, you, her email address is right there on the screen. So it's a lot of words, Jeanette.Sims at newbethelkc.org. You can reach out to our church office. Uh, you can call us by whatever means necessary. Make plans to be there so we can discuss this book. So you got to read it and you got to get into this discussion. It's going to be wonderful. So what are we going to be talking about on tonight? What is our lesson for tonight? The Lord has really been um, dealing with me on a particular subject, and, it, and it's for myself. He's been dealing with me about it. It's personal to me. So I thought this would be a, a wonderful, wonderful lesson for the saints of God. He has been dealing with me with renew your mind. Put that in the chat. Renew your mind. Lord, help me to renew my mind. This has come about because, you know, a lot of times it is our mind. It's our thoughts. It's, it's where our thoughts are going that really puts us in a damper. And the importance God has been showing me the very importance of renewing our mind. So let's get into the scripture on today. If you're ready, let's go. Um, Romans, let's go there. Romans chapter number 12. We want to read in the King James Version verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 read, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. How? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but this is it, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Put emphasis on that verse number two, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, in order for us to really grasp and understand what is being said here, we've got to define first, what does it mean to be conformed? What is that word? What is the Bible saying when it, when it says, and be not conformed to this world? The word conformed, uh, I, what it means and I've put it in Greek as well. You can pronounce that if you want to, but I needed to put it in the Greek form and go back to the original word. What was the original writer? Uh, what did they mean when they first wrote this and used the word conform? Found out that in the Greek, because the New Testament is written in Greek, it means to fashion oneself according to, conform, to fashion oneself according to. And I, I, thought it, I thought it interesting that the definition would use to fashion, you know, when you put on clothes, the clothing, you put on a fashion, it's, it's, it's a fashion, you put it on and it conforms to you, you're putting it on. So he says, be not fashioned don't fashion yourself after this world to fashion one's mind and character to another's pattern. God is very specific in the scripture. He's saying, do not conform or do not fashion your mind and character to another pattern, uh, to configure, to adopt the customs of, or to be squeezed or pressed into a mold. Mm, that's my favorite definition right there. He says, do not configure yourself 
or adopt the customs of this world. Do not be squeezed or pressed into the mold of what this world. Uh, I started to, I, and I have children, you know, I have a four-year-old and, other, and, and a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old. So we have Plato in the house. And I almost brought Plato onto this Bible study just to show you what it means to be conformed. You know, Plato doesn't really have a form. So when you take that ball of Plato and you press it into a mold, it becomes the thing that you press it in. It doesn't become the thing, but it shapes like it. It looks like it. It takes on the attributes of it. So God is saying, what I do not want for my people in this day and time and ever to conform or be pressed into the mold of this world so that they uh, conform to it. They look like it. They act like it. You can't tell the difference between them and it. Do not be conformed to this world. And I'm not talking about the way, you know, your, your earrings or your makeup or anything like that. What I'm talking about is do not fasten yourself after this world. What do I mean by the world? By the world, when the, when the Bible mentions the world, there are different definitions that uh, come to play when the word mentions the world. In this particular scripture, the word world is translated to mean the period of time. Do not conform, be ye not conformed to this age, this period of time. Uh, it even speaks of the universe. Do not be conformed to this universe. Uh, and you know, a lot of people now are uh, there are they're they're worshiping the universe as if the universe is God. But even the universe had to be created. God is the only one who has no beginning and has no end. He is the beginning. He is the end. If the universe was created, then the universe cannot be God. He says, do not be conformed to this age, this universe, or this uh, uh, never-ending cycle of the world. Uh, the definition says the perpetuity of time, meaning that it's a never-ending cycle. Uh, don't get caught up in this never-ending cycle of the world. Uh, the constitution or the order, the government, the systems of this world, don't, don't be conformed to the rules of this world because a lot of times the rules and the constitution or the order, what is what this world is governed by are, is not God. It's not God's rule. Sometimes we mess up when we think because a thing has become uh, legal or it's okay to do in this world that it must be okay with God. No, no. Don't get caught up into it because God's ways are not always our ways, and his rules are for his kingdom. And just because a thing is made legal is all right to do according to this world does not necessarily mean that God is pleased with that. So he says, don't be conformed to this world, even as it relates to the uh, inhabitants of this world. And when I say inhabitants of this world, I'm talking about the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of mankind who have alienated themselves from God and become hostile to the cause of Christ. You meet them every day. You see them on, on newscasts. You see them uh, everywhere in this world. Those who have deemed themselves separated from God, alienated from God. We don't want anything to do with God. And a matter of fact, anything that's related to God, that's related to Christ, 
to Jesus. A, a lot of times they're now, they're pushing the name of Jesus out. They're saying the most high and all of these different, it literally irritates my soul sometimes when people just say the most high. Uh, because who is the most high? The most high is Jesus. And if you cannot say Jesus, then we have an issue. We have an issue. If you cannot give that glory to God, we have an issue. So I, I know people that do that. And unless they're talking about Jesus, then there is no other high. There is no other God. There is none greater. Jesus is it. So Again, God is saying, do not be conformed to the systems of this world. The saints of God, we are, uh, we are in the world, but not a part of the world. So the Lord has been dealing with me and really convicting me in my spirit, uh, letting me know, uh, Sean, I don't want you. Be careful. Be careful. Don't teeter-totter on the edge of being conformed to everything that this world is concerned with. Concern yourself with the things of God. The Bible clearly states that in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, the word of the Lord says, love not the world. You hear it. I didn't say it. The word says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, there we go. Already three times the scripture has mentioned the world, the systems of the world, the government of this world, not literal government, but the order, uh, the law of this world. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If any man love the world, again, let's go back, let's go back. What does he mean by the world? If any man loves this age, this, this time, this the way things are, the universe, the, the never-ending cycle, the order and the ungodliness of this world. If any man love of, of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, what? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. If you find yourself uh, uh, slipping into this mode of fulfilling everything that your flesh desires, and sometimes it's not everything, it's just some things. If you slip into these, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you know, there are, there are some people who really fall and some of us really can get deep into the pride of life. We live life for others. We live life uh, to see uh, how much more we can get, how much better we can be than someone else, how many red bottom shoes we can acquire, how many uh, of the most expensive things that we can acquire. And if we're not careful, we can easily slip into the wrong spirit and become engulfed in the spirit of this world. But the Bible says it's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. I'm not saying don't have nice things and don't have good things. But when you serve the things more than you serve the God who provided you the means for the things, then we have an issue. Uh, when we uh, serve the stuff, for lack of better terms, we serve the material. Our desire is for more material, more than more of God. Uh, we have a problem with that. God has a problem with it. Uh, he says, this is not of the Father, but is of the world. And all of this is going to pass away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And I want to read that in the message version because it's really good to me. 
uh, the message says, don't love the world's ways. It makes it so plain. I don't even have to explain that. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's good. The love of the world squeezes. Didn't we just, didn't we just see that in that uh, definition of conform? Uh, the world squeezes out the love for the Father. When you are conformed to this world, and the, the lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, when you are conformed to this world, it squeezes out the love of the Father. And before you know it, the world will wring you dry of the love of God, and you become bitter, unkind. The Bible says, the love of many shall wax cold. Uh, it squeezes out the love of the Father. Then it says, practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. Oh my goodness. Help us, Lord Jesus. It just isolates you from him. The world and all it's wanting and wanting and wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants, <laughs> that's the important thing. What does God want? Put God's wants ahead of your wants. Uh, not just what I want, but what does God want out of me? Hallelujah. You ought to put that in your, I'm acting like Bishop Brady now. You see how that hallelujah just popped out of there? <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, you ought to put that into the chat right now. You ought to put that down in there <laughs> because you want to be able to not want what God does not want for you. You want to want what God wants for you. So type in there, what does God want? What does he want? That's the question to answer. What does God want out of my life? Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself. I am mighty afraid that we are living in a time where people serve themselves more than they serve God. Uh, you know, I don't even want to get into it, but how much time do we spend fulfilling our wants, never thinking about what does God want? How many times do we put our wants our time, what we desire in the front, and then we put God next. Oh, anything you put in front of God becomes the God. And he said, I will have no other God before me. Make sure that in your living your Christian life, that you make sure God is in the forefront, far and foremost. Now, I didn't say you had to go to everything and do all of that. I'm saying put God first. Let God be your uh, determining factor uh, in what you do and how you live. I love it when it says the world and all it's wanting and wanting and wanting is on its way out. Hallelujah. Now, but the Bible then goes on to says, be ye trans." Formed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I think I can pronounce the Greek word there. Uh, I took three years of Greek and Latin, but that was many, many years ago when I was in school. So the Greek word for transformed is metamorpho. Metamorpho. That is the Greek word where we get metamorphosis from. So you notice in my slide, I put a little picture there because most of us, when we think of metamorphosis, we think of how the butterfly goes from the caterpillar to the butterfly. Uh, even another one is how the, uh, the tadpole, the tadpole goes from being able to breathe underwater 
and goes through a metamorphosis where it grows legs, it grows lungs, the gills go away, and then the frog come out having to breathe oxygen and air and goes on to the land. Isn't that something? That's where we get metamorphosis. So to be transformed means to change into another form, to transfigure. Be ye changed into another form. Be transfigured to make a thorough or dramatic change in the form, appearance, or character of. I love that it mentions that transform means to make a dramatic change even in the in your character. That's being transformed. Uh, another definition says to change in condition or nature. Uh, when the caterpillar is a caterpillar, cal caterpillar, its its nature is to crawl. That's what it it does. It's in its nature. But once it goes through its transformation, the nature of it changes, and now it goes from a nature of crawling to a nature of flying. That's amazing because when you think about it and you think about what happened in the beginning, what happened with mankind in the beginning, you think back to Adam and Eve and how when God created Adam, when he created Adam and drew Eve out of Adam, created Eve out, out of Adam, the nature was twofold. You could sin or you could not sin. You had the choice to sin or not to sin. But after the fall, you became one natured. That's why everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone is born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So after the fall, you no longer had the two natures. You were now a one natured being that no matter what you did, you couldn't help it. You were born in sin. You were uh, born in that Adamic sin. But during the transformation, during the salvation process, when you are transformed, you uh, go into a new nature. You get a new nature. Now you're going back to I can or I cannot. I have a choice to or to not do. I do not have that. I can't help it. I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm with God. Not to say that we won't fall or make mistakes and things of that matter, but you now have a two natured. And if you walk in the spirit, you'll be able to operate in both of those natures. So metamorphosis come from, uh, or metamorpho, metamorphuo, uh, the first part of that comes from meta, which means to change after being with. And then morpho, morphuo, you know, metamorphuo, that portion of the word means changing form in keeping with an inner reality. So meta, change after being with. If we were to put those two words together and come up with a definition for transform, it would mean an outward change that reflects an inner reality after being with someone. <laughs> meta, have you been meta? changed after being with. That transformation happens after you've been with God, after you've been with Jesus, and you can absolutely tell those who have been with Jesus. Uh, so it is an outward change. So that's not necessarily saying that your physical attributes change, but the change on the outside that we are talking about in this particular scripture is in, is necessarily a change in action. It's a change in our choices. It's a change in uh, the outward way that we live, the outward way that we uh, respond to situations. That's the change that we are talking about when we talk about being transformed. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed how? How? The Bible is very clear. 
How do we do it? By the renewing of your mind. I seen a quote that I really, really love. The quote says, the mind is the battleground of the soul. You ought to put that in there. You ought to, and I know you can see that slide, but in the mind, there's a war going on. See, the enemy is not necessarily after your finances. He's not after your job. He's not necessarily after your children. What he is after is your mind. Your mind is where the whole battle takes place for your soul. Uh, Romans 7, 25 says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God. The enemy knows that you serve God with your mind. Yes, we, we, we have our, we lift our hands and we walk out worship, but we can do none of that if it does not first take place in our mind. It is our mind that is the portal of our soul, okay? So the enemy is after your mind. He's after your mind. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, the spirit of man is the candle or lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. What does he mean by that? If you look back and look at some of the references to that scripture, Psalms 119 verse 130 tells us the entrance of thy words giveth light. So what is happening here? The word of God is the light that goes inside the spirit of man and lights that candle. And what do we do with candles? A candle or a lamp is what's meant to go into dark places and illuminate dark places. So when it says the spirit of man is the candle or the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts, what he's saying is when the word of God, in the beginning was the word and the word was God, the word was with God. When the word of God comes through to us, even as we read the word of God, uh, the taught word of God, the preached word of God, when the word of lo the Lord comes, it comes and gives light. That light then goes into our spirit and, and that's what the Lord uses to uh, guide us. That's why it's so important for you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. St. John 12 and 35 says, walk in the light. Those who walk in darkness cannot see where they are going. So he wants us to walk in the light because the word is, is the thing that gives us light. That light lights the candle in our spirit. And then God uses our spirit to guide us. That's why when you're looking for answers from the Lord, when you're in your prayer time, how do you hear from God? It's in your mind. You hear from God in your spirit, in your mind. He speaks spirit to spirit. And it always takes me back to uh, a, a dream I had when I was 14 years old. I had given my life to the Lord and I had this dream. And to make that long story short, in the dream, an angel comes to my bed and he pulls me out of the bed, wakes me up out of the bed, and the angel does not speak words, but I perceive what he is saying spirit to spirit. The angel says to me, I have something to show you, and he takes me up, and, and before you know it, twinkle of an eye, I'm in this place I've never been before, there are tons of people there worshiping God. There's a throne so huge that you can only see the bottom and it's, it's very misty. Now, I'm 14 years old. I have not forgotten that dream. But in the dream, the angel speaks to me spirit to spirit. It is the same thing when you are in prayer, when God is speaking to you, there is not this audible voice that's going to come out of nowhere. Uh, if you're thinking like it did in the Bible with Jesus uh, when he was baptized, 
No, God speaks to us in our spirit, in our mind. And because God speaks to us in our mind, then the enemy now is after our mind. He's after our relationship with God. He wants to block out uh, God's voice in our mind and in our spirit. He wants to throw our direction because he knows that whatever our mind is on, that is what's going to lead us. That's what's going to guide us. Matter of fact, another quote says, you will always move in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. Whatever your mind is on, whatever you put your mind on, if you're Put your mind on things. And this is where the Lord had been dealing with me. Uh, the reason why this whole Bible study came to be is because God had been dealing with me about, Sean, where is your mind? What are you setting your things on? What are you allowing your mind to stay on? Is it staying on? I can't do this. I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. Oh, I'm different now. Oh, I mean, I mean, it's all kinds of, of thoughts that enter our mind that try to make us um, go in a different direction than what God wants us to go in. A matter of the fact, the enemy wants to influence your mind. And if he influences your mind, he influences your direction. So the direction that we go in now is is uh, deriving from the enemy versus deriving from God. So you have God and the enemy both after your soul. So they both want the influence of your mind. That's why your spirit must be filled with the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost comes to lead and to guide us. It is the spirit. It comes to speak to us in our mind, in our spirit, and show us the things of God and take us in the direction that God wants us to go in. And if you are not careful, you will give in to the enemy because he's influencing your mind. How is he influencing your mind? He's influencing your mind through the things that you watch, through the music that you listen to. Whatever you flood your mind with, be careful, saints of God. I know this is not your typical Bible study, it's, 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 it's not about a blessing right now. It's about saving your soul because the enemy is after your mind. If he can get your mind, that's why the Bible says we have to renew our mind. Oh, Lord have mercy. We have to renew our mind because every day when we wake up from beginning and end, it's a war between heaven and hell, between God and the enemy for our mind space. And we have to yield our spirit to God. And that way we can, that's why you can't even worship God. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, in spirit, in your mind, in your heart. That's where worship even begins. It doesn't begin with the raising of your hands. It begins in your spirit. You can go through the motions of worship and not worship. Your soul, your spirit, the enemy wants your spirit. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, verse 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Oh, this is the, this is the book of wisdom saying whoever guards his mouth and tongue, because what, and the reason I put that in there, because whatever you fill your mouth, your mind with, your mouth is going to be filled with as well. You can type that in there. Whatever you fill your mind with, your mouth is filled with as well. You will know automatically where the mind is because it starts spilling out of our mouth. So that's why the uh, the, the wise writer in Proverbs says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Psalms, and David says this in Psalms 39 and 1, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. 
The enemy is waiting. That's why the, the Lord has been dealing with we with me about my thoughts and where my mind is, uh, because he's saying, uh, wherever your mind is, you're going to start to spill it out. And the enemy needs permission from your mouth to do what he wants to do. He needs permission from you. So when you start spilling it out of your mouth, I can't, I can't do this. Oh, this gets on my nerve. Oh, that gets on my nerve. And all of these different things, uh, when all that starts to spill out, even how you feel about yourself, your image, your esteem, how you feel about people, about your church, about all of these different things, when you start spilling all of that out, he says, you've just given me permission because you've left, you've put that thing out into the airwaves. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. He is the prince of the air. So when you spill out, oh, that's why we have to be careful what we say, Lord, help me, help me. You ought to be saying it for yourself, but Lord, help me that I do not spill out of my mouth permissions to the enemy to do what I don't really want him to do in my life. Be careful, saints. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Saints of God, renew your mind. Renew your spirit. And, and, and by renewing these things, you also renew what you say. By the word renew, the scripture, it must mean that uh, something had to be new first if it needs to be renewed. Uh, so when the Bible says be renewed uh, in your mind, how do we do that? How do we renew our mind? We renew our mind with the word of God. Again, what you fill your mind with, how are you going to rebuke a devil with the word that you don't have in you? If you do not read the word, you do not study the word, you, you, uh, you do not uh, make time in prayer or make time in your life to study the word of God, even if it's just reading it, I may not understand everything I read, but I'm going to put it in there and I'm going to start studying the word because I have no ammunition if I do not have the word. It, it, coming to church only won't cut it. Uh, listening to a Bible study once a week may not cut it. You having a, a, a shout and a dance here and there on Sundays, feeling the spirit, it won't cut it. The enemy loves for you to do all of those things, but what he does not love for you to do is fill your mind with the word of God. Because if you fill your mind with the word of God, it's renewing it every day. And if he can't get to your mind, he can't get to you. The only way he can get to you is through your mind. That's why he works with people. He influences people. He influences things that will uh, that will come to your mind. So, you know, if you lose a job, in my sense, if you've lost a job or you get ill or a sickness may come, uh, what, what the enemy wants you to do is to fill your mind with that thing instead of filling your mind with, uh, by his stripes, I am healed. He doesn't want you to have the word. And if you know what the word says about you, then you can spill that out of your mouth. And God says, that's what I really wanted. That's what I wanted you to do. Now you've given me the permission to create that thing. Oh, that, that's good. So yes, I will be saying I am healed. You know, one year we went through every week, 52 uh, weeks in a year, we had a confession that we would speak out here at New Bethel Church every week. You ought to go back and pull that out and start confessing those things again, putting it out in the airwaves and saying those things, those affirmations that are true to who you are. And it's what God says and who God says you are. That way you don't be conformed or squeezed into the mold of this world, 
but then you're being transformed and metamorphosized or uh, go through a metamorphosis in your spirit and in your soul and you become what God has said you already are. Oh, that's good to my soul. Let's end it. I want to end it with this scripture. Romans 8, 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. If you're going to be conformed to anything, let's, if you're going to be squeezed into the mold of anything, let it be squeezed into the mold and the image of his son, of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to go back on your own time, and I want you to read uh, Philippians. I want you to read Philippians 2, 1 through 11. That whole thing is power packed. But let me just read this portion to you. It says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife, uh, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. This is the part I like. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you tonight to renew your mind. Again, how do we renew our mind? With the word of God with studying his word, reading his word, filling our spirit, our mind with the word of God, not just on Sunday, not just during life impact, but make it your business to say every day, I'm going to read the word of God and get it in my spirit so that I have ammunition against the enemy so that there is no room for the enemy to come in and distract my mind from the things of God. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I hope you enjoyed tonight. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Uh, again, comment about it. Put it in the chat. Talk about it. Share it. Even if you're watching this after and it's not live for you, uh, thank you for coming and watching this Bible study. Join us this Sunday as we go into worship on this Sunday in person or online. We'd love for you to be in person, but if not, join us online this Sunday. Service starts at 10 a.m. Be there. All right.